Um, I'm Alex Brickoff, and I will be your host for tonight's virtual edition of the Eastside Get Together Clinic. Uh, this clinic tonight is sponsored by the Fourth Division of the Pacific Northwest Region of the NMRA. Our clinic this month is going to be presented by Russ Segner and is titled Narrow Gauge Railroading at DuPont, Washington. Russ will discuss the history and the modeling opportunities of the DuPont Company's narrow gauge railroad that was used to deliver materials and explosives between the old DuPont Powder Works plant and the pier on Puget Sound. And good evening, everyone. Well, DuPont, as most of you know, is a little town just south of uh, Tacoma and north of Olympia. It's got quite a history. It's DuPont gets its name from the fact that there was a powder plant built there in 1906 by the DuPont Company of Delaware. It's got a French name that I can't understand or pronounce. There are two entrances into DuPont. Uh, this is the new exit on uh, I-5 into the new town of DuPont right here. It's a planned, er planned community with housing all throughout this area and the commercial center right here. But up here a little ways, right next to Fort Lewis, McCord, is the original exit into the old town of DuPont, which is right here. And the area we're describing tonight where the railroad was built is all of this campus right here. This was all owned by uh, DuPont Company. In the uh, late 70s, they sold it to Weyerhaeuser because Weyerhaeuser wanted access to the water for logs. They were shipping to the Orient, to Asia. Uh, there was a loading area here on the water and uh, there was trackage uh, from the dynamite plant down to the water, even though it was narrow gauge, they had the notion that they would connect through their railroad, the Shailas and Western, to get access to this water here for shipment of raw logs. However, the feds uh, interrupted that because they changed the law with regard to export of logs. And so it was surplus by, uh, by Weyerhaeuser. They didn't know what to do with this thousand acres. They sold all of it to their subsidiary, Quadrant Corporation. And Quadrant Corporation built this planned community of DuPont. Includes this really nice commercial center, a lot of housing, and of course, a big golf course. But here's the old town, and this is what I'm primarily interested in. Here's the plan of the powder plant as it existed in 1906. And so I-5 is right along here. And that entrance into the, uh, the town site is right here. And then that water area, that loading dock on Puget Sound is right over here. There are some remnants of the uh, railway on the golf course. And this is one of them. As you can see, these revetments here were uh, part of the concrete structures uh, where the blasting materials were prepared. And they had these blast walls so that the buildings were protected side to side if there was an explosion and the, uh, the front or the back end of the building would blow out. And so anyway, uh, here's the trackage that still exists from one of these locations. And there are several locations out on the golf course. I'm not a golfer anymore, but apparently there's several out here where you, there are pits on the golf course where if you, you know, 15, 20 feet below the, the grade there now are the remnants of some of these early manufacturing facilities. But I want to give you a little bit of an orientation to the railroad and, uh, and what it was. It was three foot narrow gauge. And this is what I found when uh, Jim had that picnic down there with the groups. What was the name of the group, Jim? Uh, we uh, meet uh, Jim Yonkin. I'll just take a minute if you don't mind. Uh, Jim Yonkins, uh, God, I don't know, 20 years ago, suggested for our Olympia monthly clinic, hey, let's go outdoors for the June meeting. And so he led us on a trek up into the Black Hills uh, where uh, Mud Bay Logging Company used to run. And I kind of picked up on it, uh, Mary and I did. And we've been having an outdoors uh, uh, affair every June since then. And Mary and I would cook hot dogs and some of the gals would bring a salad and stuff. Uh, we were called the uh, Gophers, Greater Olympia Prototype History 
and Engineering Research Society, <laughs> G-O-P-H-E-R-S. And okay. that was just one of our Gophers meeting. We've had, uh, there were seven or eight before that, and we've had six or seven uh, after that. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yeah, this is, uh, it was quite a fun day, and uh, this is what we saw. They have this little locomotive, uh, a 12-ton Plymouth, which still is operational, and quite a bit of equipment. These are static displays. This is a Brookville uh, gasoline-powered engine uh, locomotive, although it does not have the, uh, the engine in it. That's long disappeared. The story was that... Uh, it was taken off site to get repaired as a Chrysler uh, V8, apparently, and it never made it back to the uh, campus. And there's one of the flat cars. This is behind the Fort Lewis Museum. They've, you've seen that from I-5. And behind that was, uh, is, was several pieces of equipment. I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of the, the plant as it existed, built in 1906. It initially dealt with uh, uh, black powder and dynamite, and then subsequently several other blasting materials. And Jim, you probably got more information on that than I do. But they had several different types of locomotives on there, including a number that were basically uh, air powered or uh, compressed air, because you're operating in, in and amongst explosives materials. They had a, num a number of internal combustion engines and all of these had very elaborate spark arrestor systems on, uh, on the locomotives to prevent any kind of an accidental ignition. And here you see the flat cars with these barrels on them of uh, various, I'm not sure whether this was waste material or supplies, but the ends of these uh, flat, flat cars had a little semicircle cut into this end, the end platform uh, to hold these. Uh, barrels on in place and of course then they would wrap them with cable and so on. This is one of the box cars. I just think this is a delight, delightful little model to build. It's 22 feet long. Jim's did an extensive bit of measuring with me. He's got the drawings on this. Uh, but it seems to me it's like 21, 22 feet long, Jim, uh, and about 56 inches wide. Pretty darn tiny. These are little 10 or 15 ton trucks underneath it. Uh, the simple door here's sliding. Um, this is a, a, a photograph of one back east and one of the plants back in, in Delaware. But the nice thing about them that I like is they had these end platforms uh, where there would be a brakeman station on each end or whichever end was appropriate as they uh, were, were working through the grades. This is a picture of the three units that they salvaged when they closed the plant down. They uh, got rid of most of the equipment by selling it off to farmers and others for storage buildings and so on. But they kept these three. One's a steel frame flat car. This is the box car. And this is a little 14 foot flat car. And this is the way they existed when the plant was turned over to Weyerhaeuser uh, from uh, DuPont. And the army helped move all of this equipment, we'll see that in a second, uh, onto the campus around the museum building itself. This slide is in here because of, it's the only one I have which shows the DuPont logo, DuPont Powder Company um, here on one of those, uh, those cars. This is a picture of two cars back east again. I like this one, it's the same dimensions as the other one, except this one is an inside sheath car and the others out here are all outside sheath. These are very simple construction with mortise and tenon. These uh, verticals and diagonals pin into the sill plate here and into a top plate here. So uh, very simple construction, very, very typical of early um, equipment like this. There were usually four beams running from the front to the back, two on each side, and then two down the center that were uh, uh, that would capture the, uh, the coupler mechanism. And we'll see that in the flat car. This is a crate of some kind of big equipment that they were moving around this campus, and I have no idea what it was. 
This is the little 14 footer. Um, simple as all get out, with pedestal trucks. And I've built a model of this in S scale. And um, the little rascal is, uh, uh, is all of uh, that long. Not, it's about two and a half inches long. See that door right there past the flat car? Yeah. Uh, that was for offloading giant rolls of uh, paper in that door, which was a warehouse. Uh, and on the other end of the warehouse was the uh, shell making machines. So uh -huh. the paper would come in there in great big rolls and be offloaded. Then when the machine would run out of paper, why well, we would load on a new great big roll of probably weight, I don't know, two, 300 pounds. And it would make the shells uh, to be filled with powder to make sticks of dynamite. But that was the warehouse. Okay, this, this little car was obviously move, used to move supplies in and around the plant. They had six or eight of them. Uh, we all only have the one that still exists. Over here in this other photograph is a steel car that was sort of a cage. Now, Jim, uh, do you have a knowledge of, of what this was used to carry? Yes. Uh, the, at the end of the shell making machines, uh, which would take a flat sheet of paper and around a mandrel would uh, produce a, a empty shell crimped at one end, but open on the other, ready to be filled with powder. Uh, every, those uh, empty shells were handled in what looked like, um, you know, you've seen those uh, storage crates that are uh, either aluminum or plastic that people buy to store things in garage. Well, these were about uh, oh, four or five feet long. Uh, 18, 20 inches wide, uh, and you'd fill those with shells and stick them up in there. The houses that would actually produce the powder, having filled those shells back into the crates, would stick them right in there. And there would be two crates high in each one of those receptacles. So it'd be two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four. Uh, before that happened, uh, uh, after I would help make the shells, I worked in the shell house because not being 21 yet, I couldn't be around powder. That was a company rule. Uh, the shells would go from uh, where I uh, made them on the machine into the crates. Uh, they would go into an adjoining room where they would be dripped with hot wax. Uh, and that's why sticks of dynamite all have that waxy surface to them. Um, the wax thing uh, would melt. There was a giant vat that would melt an entire keg, a, a big keg of wax, uh, just melt it all. Uh, and then it would be sprayed over those things. We figured out on the night shift early on that if we could uh, throw a can of soup or something in there and retrieve it with a string, well, we could have a hot dinner. And the guy working the shell house one night put in a can of Spanish rice and the phone rang and he had to take one of these cars out to a uh, powder house uh, in the meanwhile, his Spanish rice was cooking. It exploded when he got back to the lunchroom. And I think that the timbers that are still in the remaining building still have little BBs of rice embedded in them everywhere. <laughs> can of Spanish rice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, one of the other pieces of equipment that I find fascinating, I'm going to build a model of this, is a similar, it's on a 14 foot chassis, flat car. Uh, with a, a canopy on it and a simple toolbox at the end. And it looked to me like there was an air compressor and some other tools on it. And I suspect it was moved around for maintenance of track and other stuff on, on the campus. But um, I really surprised to find this. And you notice the roof here, it's corrugated iron and you can see it running four and a half. This just shows you the extent of a lot of equipment there. Lots and lots of box cars, lots and lots of flat cars. And here's the little uh, Plymouth moving several of these cars in and around these buildings. And here you can see uh, uh, what looks to me to be a big mound. And I suspect there was a magazine inside this mound of, of material. Couple more flat cars. I'm not sure what this is, uh, whether it's one of those uh, cars that Jim was just describing or not. Yes, it is. But it, it's got this very interesting uh, uh, 
scheme on the end of it that tells you to be aware. <laughs> and I spent here's a whole a, afternoon on that very spot uh, okay. one day with a steam cleaner hooked up to the hose from the shack, just trying to steam clean the wax uh, off all of the stuff. Obviously, there was uh, nothing much to do that day, and the foreman just it was keeping me busy. Very good. I love this scene because it's got the track in the tight radiuses and a nice detail of the the uh, wood down the middle of the track to keep the guy's feet from getting all muddy and so on. Uh, those were the kind of uh, coveralls we had to wear in the plant. Uh, there were no pockets. There was only a, a lace type pocket where you could keep a rag. Uh, you could not have anything in your pockets whatsoever. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, no. Yep. And most of the tools would have been brass, wouldn't they? Yes, they were. Uh, all of the tools uh, in the mix. The mix houses where they mixed the powder were made out of uh, wood. They were wood bowls. Right. The uh, great big mix master uh, mixers that were made out of wood. Everything they could was made out of wood. And with the very few metal tools they had they had to be strictly accounted for. And with one, if ever one was missing, it was your obligation to shut down the entire production line. And wow. boy, if you did that, oh boy. Here's uh, again some samples of the structures. I find these very, very interesting. This would make a great ON30 layout actually, or an HON3 layout, if you can scratch build this locomotive. Uh, corrugated iron on the, on the sides and then corrugated iron on the roof on this building. And here's shingles on this guy with ventilators on top and so on. Just fascinating collection of buildings. And I love the track work inside the plant, all these little sightings and, and so on, very tight, um, very uh, compact little, uh, little show. This one's kind of interesting because uh, right here uh, looks like gas pumps. And I don't know what the, I assume that they were, were used to fuel uh, uh, engines and probably uh, equipment that uh, would be carried around on flat cars. Boy, I'll bet it's the company pickup trucks because uh, they didn't uh, allow any gasoline powered locomotives in the in the powder line. Right. And that's why they were all dieselized. So this would be for vehicles? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Again, uh, I love these scenes where you've got this mixture of buildings, um, two totally different types of uh, siding and so on. <clears throat> Here's a, I think this is at the top of the grade. This is the same building, obviously, right here, same guy and the same engine. And here it's headed off down the valley toward the water. And here we have a picture of the, one of the uh, train sets going down the hill. I understand this was about a four or four and a half percent grade. Here's a color shot of it. That was the day we went on. Oh, that was just before we went on the hike. Right. Now, the uh, I understand that when we went on the hike, the railroad was not there. None of this track was there. Yeah. And it, this grade has been washed, uh, broken by a uh, gully now, wash out. Uh, but it theoretically could be restored. The trail system is part of the uh, the potential trails for the city. Found this really, really interesting. This is the main line, now the BNSF, going from Seattle to Olympia and on down to Portland. Here comes the track down at the bottom of that grade, curls around and out along the shore, and then around the curve out to this ocean dock. Very typical. At the time this photo was taken, all of this was on trestle work, double track main line. But notice here the bucket, uh, or a, a bucket or a carton or carriage of some kind on this tram cableway comes through here and down to the dock. I suspect this is the way they moved um, hazardous materials uh, in and around the plant. I don't know for a fact. Oh, it's, uh, it's for offloading uh, the inert material. Uh, if I can, nitroglycerin was an immense improvement over black powder. Oh, yeah much more powerful and so on. Uh, but there were three things that would set it off. Uh, one uh, would be uh, jar it just slightly. 
uh, and two would be a change in temperature. You, you, you've made it just fine indoors and you go outdoors, the damn thing blows up. And the third thing would be just to look at it harshly would blow it up. So uh, what they figured out in short order uh, was to mix it with an inert material. And that could be anything from peanut shells to anything you could think of. And so that aerial tramway, uh, similar to the ones in Colorado for ore, uh, were like ore buckets, but they were offloading any kind of inner, inner material they could get from the freighters uh, and on the tram on up to a uh, warehouse. Okay, so this would have been bringing in material. Both, uh -huh. both. Yeah, uh, uh, powder would go out uh, to uh, build the Panama Canal, right. uh, the Alcan Highway, and uh, every war that the uh, United States fought with the exception of the Revolutionary War. Yeah, the plant did supply all the way up through Vietnam. This is a picture on the dock, looking back, and there's the um, BNSF main line. And uh, there's your little Plymouth again, and then the boxes of material that are being ready to ship. And uh, found it interesting, they always seem to have an idler car between uh, the stuff that came down the hill and uh, and the locomotive, I truly don't understand what safety feature that added. Because if something ignited, I think everything was gone. There's another shot with a little uh, DuPont boat. I don't know what this was used for, Jim. You may have some history on this. I don't. Um, but it obviously was used in connection with the plant operation. It's amazing how long you could work there, two years for me, and how little you would know because it was strictly verboten to go anywhere except <laughs> your exact place of work. Uh, yeah. There were three lines uh, that produced powder out there in the woods separated by maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 yards apart. It's like three yard tracks, but spaced far apart. And then uh, powder buildings uh, that made the powder another uh, 100 feet or so along the line apart from each other. And you didn't go anywhere around there to investigate. Uh, we tried it one time and boy, we got our butts chased out of there and we'd have been fired if they caught us. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. The other thing I wanna share uh, with you, notice the track is built on top of the dock. A lot of guys, when they build models of, of dockside facilities with rail, put the rail down in and amongst the timbers but here, this is, and they typically were done this way with the rail on top of the timbers. The other intriguing thing to me is this is one of the very few narrow gauge railroads that I know of, three footers, that had tie plates. This guy had full fledged tie plates on all, this, all the rail. Here's a one piece of track that still exists. This is going under I-5, I and uh, I'm sorry, under the Burlington Northern Santa Fe track above. And this is a concrete structure that replaced that timber trestle. But this bit of curved track is still there. And here's the end of track. The dock was long gone and, and there are no remnants other than just a few pilings and the track just ends right here. The one thing I did notice that, that somebody had taken the uh, frog and the points and it, and it uh, run off with those. So they were not available. Just another shot of the, uh, of the dock. I think this would make a terrific model railroad actually, if somebody wanted to spend the effort to, to detail it. This is a picture of them moving the equipment with using the Corps of Engineer guys um, from Fort, Lewis McCord, um, notice how tiny that little engine is compared to this big flatbed. And here they are building track uh, to, for the setup of the equipment. The museum building itself is still there and very active. I think it's still open only on two days a week. It's all volunteers. Uh, they had a big stack of ties back here. These are long gone now. Uh, because they were a sort of rat infestation and bugs. Uh, but they had enough track and rail, uh, or ties and rail, to add another s several hundred feet to this, but we've never gotten around to that. Yeah, the but, roadbed is actually the old 
Northern Pacific standard gauge roadbed coming into the plant. Right. This yeah. is not the original narrow gauge piece of it. But yeah, there was narrow gauge or standard gauge trackage throughout the plant. Uh, well, just quite only a bit as far of as the uh, warehouses. They yeah. didn't go anywhere near the powder. Yeah. And we can go back to the very second slide I showed of the map. It shows the two different rail lines. This is that 22 footer, the boxcar. Um, this is its current condition. Well, this was shot about four years ago. Uh, it's in pretty decent shape, except there's a lot of rot along the ends, um, the sides, and the two end platforms need to be completely rebuilt. But the frame of this car is broken. And uh, one of those, or two of those beams that run the center of the car would need to be replaced. It's got the corrugated iron roof on it. Very interesting little detail with the uh, uh, the rollers uh, on the track here. This track is like a one and three quarter inch pipe. So the, the, the rollers just roll across the top of it. Very, very simple construction. Here's a little detail of it. This is the steel flat car that we worked on. The steel was intact and in very good condition as were the truck sets, which are right here. And this is about as simple as you can get for a truck. Um, the difficulty today in modeling this would be to find the wheel sets uh, that small. You could probably scratch build them or have them uh, fabricated for you. But here's your steel frame and on the inside where these timbers that were cut at an angle to accommodate the, the tapers on the inside of this uh, I-beam or half of an I-beam. And I cut these at Snoqualmie uh, Museum. We had access to a big four foot uh, clearance bandsaw. So I cut all these there and uh, carried them down here and then we trimmed the link. Um, and then these were bolted to the steel frame and then the wood decking was bolted to this, and you'll see that here shortly. Some details on the ends uh, with the bolsters. They had both steel frame structures, which this guy is, and wooden ones. So they had cars that were steel framed and wooden framed. Although I don't, I think this is a beam, Jim, uh, not cladding, because it looks, there's no evidence of a gap here. So I think this is a full-fledged, typically like an eight foot, eight inch by six inch timber. And here we are working on these pieces to put this sucker back together. We had a pretty good little crew, uh, uh, Jim and, and uh, uh, three or four other guys. Robert, Robert Grove and uh, Roger Nelton. Yeah, Grove and uh, Nelton. And who else? There was one other guy. I can't think of his name. But we had one of the state representatives, the state house senators was involved in this early on. He showed up to uh, critique our work. <laughs> it was interesting. Now here you can see this piece of uh, flooring needed to be uh, cut to clear the, the rivets on this center beam. And so we had a little bit of hand work to do on all of these. And here we go to the end. And you notice right here, these have got these little concave cutouts to hold a barrel in place on the ends. The fortunate thing is we had all the steel work intact uh, for most of these cars. And here's the finished deck. Uh, wasn't quite done. We hadn't driven these bolts down through yet. Mary and I varnished that one weekend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here it is finished. Now, we've I don't think we've ever painted. Did we ever paint these end, ends? I can't remember. remember. Very interesting here, the detail. Here's the uh, locomotive, of course. Notice it's the standard gauge coupler and the narrow gauge coupler. Quite a bit of difference. They're about 60% of the size of the big ones. But it had airlines. So this was equipped with air brakes. The little 14-footers uh, were not. 
And I'm not sure whether they had airlines running through them or not. I don't think so. I don't think they ever went down to the bottom of the grade. But here's a 14 footer that we got uh, when I first went out there and we started to think about, well, maybe we could rebuild that rascal. Hmm. And it's like a shake the box kit in the uh, HO or O scale, no big deal. Got wood pieces there and some steel and you're ready to go. So uh, Jim was a big part of this. We took all of these pieces apart, cleaned them, measured them, photographed them. We get fortunately at each end, there was enough material at one end or the other to get accurate dimensions on the cross sections of these timbers. Exactly. And we also had enough in the center line, center beams longitudinally to get the spacing of the beams. But there was not a complete run through from end to end of any of it. So we had to extrapolate from each end and we ended up with a pretty accurate rebuild. Just some more the details. These are the, there are two center beams that surround the coupler mechanism. These run the length of the car and they're notched here for this cross beam. And then there's steel structures, one on each side of the coupler itself, which is trapped between these steel castings. You see these square plates and the spring between them. This is what provides the slack in the coupler to uh, keep it, uh, to give some give when their cars are coupled together or when they're pulling with slack in the train. Very, very simple. These are just held together by bolts, through bolts. Um, and that's what determines the spacing of these beams. Here's the, uh, the, the uh, one side of the car that was pretty much intact. So we took all this stuff apart and cleaned it all with wire brushes and, and uh, scraped them with chisels and so on. And then we coated them. And I can't for the life of me think of what this coating is, but it's a material that turns the rust, rusted steel into uh, a um, version of iron that will, will not rust anymore. It turns it to the FEO4. Was that the that Fred Foreman came up with? No, this is what we used at Snoqualmie. Oh, and this is what we used on the chapel car and the other stuff that I worked on when I first got involved out there. Huh. But it had this milky texture to it, which uh, this was, these were wet just after we painted them and we left them there to dry and so on. But all the of rust oleum did, will do the same thing. Rust oleum. Again? Rust oleum. Ah, well, no, you this can buy is, that in a hardware store. Yeah. Well, this Spray was paint. Another product is called Ospho. What yeah. is it? Ospho, O-S-P-H-O, Ospho. I think that sounds like it. But in any case, we took all of those parts apart and cleaned them and got them all ready to go. Here's one of the pedestals and uh, all the bolts. Putting a, something like this back together, the expensive part are these darn bolts. These are not cheap. Then here's one of those coupler pieces. There are four of these, two at each end that trap the coupler in between right here. These are big beams that we sourced from a local supplier. Uh, I'm not sure where I got that. I think I got these out in uh, the area and uh, had them trucked down here. Mm -hmm. um, these are the raw material for the 14 footer. Yeah, Mary and I uh, brought those down in my uh, pickup from Mankey on the uh, Dakota Mankey, class. That's what I did. And uh, they told us that uh, uh, we couldn't do that in the pickup truck, but uh, they hung out the back and I put a red flag on them, of course, but on the front end, I loaded the big sacks of uh, cement on the front end. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everything we worked on here was heavy, I'll tell you that. And here's uh, yours truly uh, chipping on the one of these end beams. Now these were salvaged beams we got from Everett from a, one of the Weyerhaeuser mills up there. They were donated to us. And uh, I've got video and other pictures I didn't include in tonight um, of us cutting these beams. We had to trim two inches off of each dimension, off of one side and off the bottom. And uh, used a, a saw that was sort of like this one that's Jim operating, except it was three times this big. It's a beam saw 
and the blade was like 18 inches in diameter. And you don't push it like this, you ride it. Mm -hmm. That's literally what we did. And I've got good video of that and I should have included it in tonight. Um, but anyway, Jim is cutting the notches for these pedestals. And here I'm trimming for that end beam. And here are these notches that we had to cut. The pedestal sit in here. Then we had to locate these holes because they were through bolted from the top to the bottom. They're good notches, bueno notches. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, here's uh, Fred Foreman, who's a city employee. He's the head of their uh, maintenance or building group. Um, he's the head guy in town that fixes everything. But he's devoted his, a lot of spare time to this. And he's the one that got kept the locomotive running and so on. Here he's measuring that notch for that cross beam. We took lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures. Then here are two of these finished beams. These are the center beams. Here's the pedestal in place. It's bolted through from the top to the bottom and then from side to side. And here's one um, sitting ready to, uh, to get placed in its notch. So here's the outside frame and the way this thing sits or operates is that the outside beams carry the weight of the, the structure on the pedestals that transfer the weight to the track through the wheels. And then these have cross beams and then the center line two beams hang underneath these cross beams. And here you get an idea. So here's the cross beams and these are anchored to the top of these beams that rest on the pedestals. The cross beams are suspended and they're through bolted for the cross beams here. And so these two ride, these two ride not directly on the axles or the pedestals at all. Pretty clever and very simple design. And here you can see the coupler and that mechanism that I described that's captured by those two plates. There's Roger Knowlton and there's truly and uh, I can't, is that, who's that in the back? Is that Grove? Could be. Anyway, this is the way this rascal's built. There is one diagonal right here in the middle. And uh, yeah, that's got, the only yeah. car that had the longitudinal plank. Those are the planks that uh, Mary and I hauled down from um, Mankey. How long are those suckers? Well, these are about 16, well, they were originally about 16 feet. Well, they hung out the back of my pickup and we just held them down in the front with, with sacks yeah. <laughs> of gravel and stuff. And also got, I've got a couple of spreader bars that I use in the back of my pickup that you just clamp them right on down top and then clamp them to the gunnels. It keeps them from bouncing up. And I'll tell you, we tried to avoid potholes all the way. Oh yeah. Well, here's the beginning of the thing, look, the beginning. Now this car that we rebuilt has no brake system. But the car that they had at Fort Lewis had all of the underbody details still intact. So it was a simple outside hung brake beam that was uh, actuated by uh, a, uh, a brake wheel at each end with a chain and rod mechanism. Very, very simple. So on the model that I'm building, I'm going to put the underbody, all the rigging underneath it. So we fortunately had that uh, to uh, give us the information we needed. And here's the finished car. Beautiful. They had very interesting little switch stands. I've got several shots of these, but this little very simple little mechanism functions extremely well. Here's the locomotive. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sure it's a diesel, isn't it, Jim? Yes. And there's your well, fuel it was tank. gas, but they, uh, uh, DuPont took all the gas engines out of any of the locomotives that would enter the, the uh, right. powder part. And then uh, Fred rewired the whole thing, and it's really kind of a hodgepodge of wiring, but it certainly functions. And this is what it looks like today. Weyerhaeuser donated enough money to build this canopy to keep uh, three of the cars uh, and the locomotive out of the heavy snow and rain. The city's built a, a corrugated or a, a cyclone fence around this 
with a nice walkway out here and street lights to uh, light it. And so it's a very, very nice facility. There's a gate on here now and so on. So that's the end of my presentation per se. I do have a little bit of video to play for you. You can see the sidewalk out here uh, that the people were standing on in the street lamps. That's Fred working on some of the drilling. And I've got one more segment here to show you. As usual, when you finish a project like this, there are a lot of people who show up and they would like to be associated with the project when all the work's done. <laughs> so this is a bunch of city leaders, et cetera, showing up. Okay. So there you go. Thank you, Jim, for helping with this. Terrific job, Russ. You did good. Okay. Uh, well, that, that's about it. We'll we'll see. We'll see everybody later. Bye bye.